are expected to face off in a televised debate on Sunday. The two former presidents are competing to become the island state's next leader on the 19th of December. The pair have crisscrossed the island nation of 25 million people, promising voters a better future. Campaigning for the second round of voting has been underway since Tuesday after both failed to get an outright majority in the first round vote. Ravalu Manana got 35.3% of the vote in the first leg of presidential polls in November, while Rajolina managed 39.2%. The current president, Harry Rajau Nariman Pianina, got just 8.8% of the vote and will not take part in the second round. The court rejected his request to have the election cancelled. Frank Lekaba is a researcher at the uh, Institute of uh, South African Relations, a unit at the Human Sciences Research Council, and is currently doing his PhD on Madagascar. He joins us from a Pretoria studio. A very good evening to you, uh, Mr. Lekaba. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, four ex-presidents, 36 candidates. This is unprecedented, isn't it? I would like to see blood on the floor, metaphorically speaking. Yes, uh, in this interview, uh, now the, the second run off, is between two horses. Uh, in the first round, we saw 36 candidates, uh, 22 uh, attempted to defer the elections, citing uh, irregularities. And they went to the court, they didn't succeed. And it was expected that the two that have made it now, which is the former president, Mark Ravalo Manana and Rara Jolina, it was expected that they will now proceed to the second runoff because this contest, in a nutshell, was a contest of people with money. And uh, other candidates did not have, their pockets were not as loaded as the two candidates, uh, even including the uh, president, Herira Jonamampianina, did not have loaded pockets like uh, the two, Rajuelina and Ravalo Manana. You would remember uh, Ravalo Manana is a businessman and Rajolina is also a businessman who is well established, who has got a, a TV channel, who has got various interests. Uh, so they have accumulated a lot they could afford to contest for these elections. And here they are now. We'll see on the 19th who will really uh, make it to be the president. Mr. Ligaba, there is a, I mean... <laughs> It's, it's safe to say that there is absolutely little interest in what happens in uh, Madagascar and there is little media scrutiny. Why should the international community care about this, these uh, elections in Madagascar? Yes, it's true. The interest has been very minimal. But uh, when you observe since the 2009 uh, coup, uh, there has been a kind of certain interest in Madagascar. In fact, I can safely say the interest has been lacking from the SADC region. But from the Americans, from the French, and from the Canadians, there has been an interest in Madagascar. And this is not accidental, because when you look at the southern region, SADC region, uh, Madagascar is the only country that, was col that is a former colony of France. Uh, mainly the countries in the region are former colonies of, of, of the British, uh, they have a very integrated economies, where else Madagascar uh, is not so much integrated in the economic system of the region. Uh, you would remember Madagascar falls under Comesa, when most of the countries in the region uh, fall under the SACU uh, form of trade. But since the 2009 uprising and the coup, SADC has intervened, and since the intervention of SADC, uh, there has been... Uh, interest. I think the lack of interest has been from the media, but generally there has been an interest. Uh, why is Madagascar important? It is crucial. It cannot be ignored in the in Sadek region, because uh, when you compare Sadek and other regions of the continent, it's relatively stable, with the exception of Lesotho and, and Zimbabwe. Very few countries have got instability in the Sadek region. So Madagascar has become one of those uh, countries that have really posed uh, difficulty for the peace infrastructure for, 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 for the southern African region. So it is very important in that, in that respect. It is also important in the sense that uh, when you look at the philosophy of Afri African Renaissance, 
uh, it seeks to lift uh, all the peoples of the continent out of the poverty and, and inequality challenges that the rest of the African countries are facing. So Madagascar is very important in that sense because it is ranked 161 according to the Human Development Index, the UN Human Development Index. So it's one of the least developed countries in the, in the world. So it's very important in that respect that when we move to talk about uh, Africa's rebirth, countries like Madagascar, uh, the, the economic development, political stability are very important in that respect. I mean, the corruption is quite endemic in that country. I mean, there's a lack of uh, governance or good corporate governance. It led to the plundering of natural resources. Malagasy people remain poor, more poor than ever. As a matter of fact, about 92% of the population live on less than $2 a day. And uh, will this election bring an end to the turmoil that was seen after the coup in 2009? Or is it going to bring a restart to that, to, to the crisis? Simpua, it's expected that the elections should bring a breakthrough both economically and, and, and socially for the people of Madagascar. Uh, you'll remember since 2009 after the coup, the economy went down. Uh, the economic growth was on the negative side. And when President Rajwana Mampianina took over in 2013, he stressed the point of economic development. Uh, you remember he went to France, Paris in, in, in 2016 to convene the Donors and Investors Conference, seeking to bring donors back to the country to reinvest in the economy of the country. It's a very sad case, the issue of Madagascar, because the economy is a donor-based and foreign direct-based economy. This is despite the fact that Madagascar has got mineral resources like any other African country has got the potential to grow. But uh, the political instability has really uh, hampered with the development of the country. So these elections are very crucial for Madagascar because uh, the next administration has to come up with a national development plan. Uh, the national development plan that has been there was linked to the term of President Rajwan Wampianina. And this has been a trend in Madagascar that every president that comes in comes in with a national development plan limited for five years. So Madagascar is one of those countries that really need to come up with long-term development strategies. And one of those uh, that is required for the next president is to come up with a national development plan. The second thing is the next president has to really implement the issue of reconciliation in the country. Because this is an island that has got over 16 ethnic groups, has got a history of division, ethnic division. Uh, so the next president has to make sure that they practicalize and implement the, the, the reconciliation process, as was recommended by the SADC roadmap. It was the major, one of the major recommendations of the SADC roadmap that there should be reconciliation in the country in order for there to be stability and in order to unlock the economic potential of Madagascar. So the next, these elections are important in that respect. Let's talk about some of the uh, presidential candidates, uh, Mr. Lukaba. I mean, uh, Andrew Rajolina, for instance, where does this leave um, his, uh, you know, the legitimacy of his candidacy since he was disqualified by international protocols against unconstitutional government reforms? Both Mark Ravalomane and Ra Ra Andri Rajolina were prohibited from contesting the, the 2013 elections. And this is how the current president, Rajan Mampianina, came into power. Uh, Rajan Mampianina it was expected from some of us who are following the dynamics in Madagascar. Uh, it was expected that he would not make it to the second runoff because he was a minister in the presidency of Rajolina, uh, Rajolina that came into power in, in 2009. And he was supported by Rajolina to be the president after Rajolina was prohibited from being a president. So these two candidates that are moving into the second runoff were stopped by the international community. But that was for strategic reasons. Uh, because SADC and the international community were emphasizing the issue of political stability and reconciliation. 
And these two contenders were, the, were at the heart of the political instability in the country. So for there to be political stability, they had to be sidelined to a certain extent. And uh, to a certain extent, the international community won that case. Uh, you remember this year, around April, President Rajana Mampianina tried to introduce electoral laws that, pro that would prohibit these two protagonists from running for the elections. The, the uh, Constitutional Court put aside that uh, uh, process of uh, Rajan Mampianina. In fact, what the Constitutional Court did was to dissolve the cabinet and ask President Rajan Mampianina to form a, a, a cabinet that will, take the that will prepare the country for the elections, the November elections. So now these two candidates have been, have been declared fit to stand by the courts. They don't have any issues of illegitimacy hanging on their heads. Hence, at this point, they are now running for the second elections, for the second round of elections. I mean, for President uh, Rajao Mariam Pianina to have garnered only 8% of the vote, what could have possibly gone wrong? I mean, he, he himself faced attempts of impeachment at some point. Yeah, like I indicated, Simpiwe, uh, Rajao Mariam Pianina did not come into being a president because of his own making. He was made president by Rajao Alina, and he was the minister in the presidency of Rajao Alina. And when he became, after he became a president, I think three months after he became the president, he launched his political party. And uh, the political party did not really gain the legitimacy it sought to achieve. This president faced two motions of no confidence, the impeachment. First impeachment was successful, according to the numbers of the members of parliament present to vote. Uh, it was averted by the constitutional court. The second uh, impeachment was also averted by the Constitutional Court, uh, especially this year, when he tried to come up with the new electoral uh, laws. And the court decided that he should dissolve his cabinet and institute a new cabinet uh, made up of all, or representative of all political parties in parla parliament. All right, Mr. Likaba, thank you so much for your update. We really appreciate your time. That was Frank Likaba, the res researcher at the Africa Institute of South Africa. This is the Globe on SAPC News. We'll have more news shortly after the break.